We're live. I'm Jay Williams. Today I'm going to teach you how to do an interview. Come with me. And how to be an entrepreneur too. So I'll be real with you, I got into broadcasting, especially on the basketball side, because I got lucky. You know, we talk about being privileged, how that carries a lot of connotation in our society today. I was what we call athlete privilege. I got a job because I played sports, even though I had no idea how to actually do my job. So I got a lot of grace for me learning how to do it. Let me tell you about my first time on TV. I'm doing this interview with a head coach from Syracuse. His name is Jim Beheim. My host is asking Jim a question about UConn basketball. And while Jim is answering the question, I'm looking at Jim, I'm looking at Jim, everything's great. I'm thinking about what question I want to ask. My producer jumps in my ear and says, Ah, UConn basketball stinks, Syracuse basketball rules. And at that moment, I ended up answering my producer in my ear live on TV saying, Syracuse doesn't suck, what are you talking about? Jim Beheim looks at me and is like, what are you talking about? Because he obviously can't hear the conversation that my producer is having with me in my own IFB. So for me, at time, all of a sudden, Twitter started going crazy. What's wrong with Jay Will? Is there something wrong with him? Does he have to, I'm like, no, I swear, I just, and you can't even explain it because you're balancing a multitude of conversations. So remember, if your producer jumps in your ear, do not answer him. Just focus on the person talking on set. Step one, practice your craft daily. So you're gonna ask yourself, Jay, how am I going to do that? I don't have equipment, I don't have lighting, I don't have cameras. Well, you take it to the streets. So here's what my friends and I used to do back in the day. I would literally go out in the streets of New York City and I would say, hey Amy, throw me a word. Hi. And I would build conversations off that word and see if I can talk to people for three minutes at a time. It's called bridging. It's like improv. So, but hey, what color tie do you like? I'm more of a blue guy. Are you a green guy? Oh, your favorite color is pink? Wow, my daughter's color is pink. Her name is Amelia. Do you have any kids? What are your kids' names? But this is a great exercise to do any kind of interview because they are going to be strangers. You may not know things about them or you may know things about them, but your ability to get them to continue to talk and tell more about themselves while connecting it to your own story, that's the brilliance of doing an interview. This is embarrassing. When I was in college, I wasn't necessarily the most, must, prime example of the must, the most articulate person there was. I used to talk with a little bit of a slur. And when I got at ESPN for my first three years, they had me work with a broadcasting coach. And he had me take my index finger and my middle finger and put them on my teeth like this and rest my tongue in between my two fingers and make these sounds as warm-up exercises for my voice. And it went something like this. <laughs> Awkward, but the most amazing thing from doing that every single day is that you recognize when people talk, they talk from here. They don't talk with their stomach. The more you activate your core, all of a sudden your words sound more powerful. There's more tonality to your words. So remember, you get a chance at home, work on this. Ha! Number two, prep your thoughts and prep your interviewee with small talk. Prime example, I was doing a sit down with Serena Williams for a brand. But when she first came in, I said, so how does it feel to have the last name of a champion? And she said, ha, I should be asking you that because we both have the same last name, Williams, right? But it was a little joke just to ease her into the conversation. And I think just connecting those dots for people before the interview even starts, they become a lot more easy because they understand that this is about, hey, wow, we just found rhythm before the interview even started. And you never know, if the cameras are rolling, you'll probably catch some intimate moments. Step three, pivoting is imperative. I was talking to this athlete about his mother passing away. And the athlete started to get very emotional. And out of nowhere, I saw the emotion coming. And he was also a little bit reluctant to go there. So what I did is I started naturally thinking about, hey, something happened, something dropped in the background. I said, oh, that's gonna be off camera. And he started laughing, right? And I said, don't worry about it, man. We don't have to talk about your mom, it's okay. I'm going through some issues with my mother too. And I know how difficult it could be. And right there in that moment, just by connecting my story, 
and throwing the ball somewhere else for a minute to take his mind off how deep the subject was, he thought to himself, don't worry about it, Jay. It's, it's okay, we can go there. Step four, make real moments, but how you do it is so important. Prime example, I got invited to Auntie Oprah's house, Oprah Winfrey, and I'm sitting in the backyard, and she's asking me about one of the most monumental moments of my life. But it was the way she asked me, and she said to me, Jay, I've often thought about what my life would be if. How much time do you spend on the if? Just the pause that she delivered that question with and everything stopped. And all of a sudden I found myself locking eyes with Oprah. I'm like, where the hell am I about to go? She's just tapping into my soul. I'm about to tell her something I've told nobody else before in my life. And I just end up ha you know, talking and talking. And next thing I know, I felt like I was having a 15 minute long conversation, just like it was me and Oprah and nobody else was there. So look, if you feel something, go ahead and ask it. But remember how you ask something could be the difference between a good interview and a bad one. I don't really know what it was to be a black entrepreneur or a successful black C-level executive. But the first person I got a chance to meet to do that, that really helped me tap into the world was my father. Him bringing me into New York City every day and seeing the work environment was an earth shattering experience for me. Because 99.9% .9 of the time, my dad was the only black person in all these rooms. And it never once bothered him. He was too busy being engaged and immersed in what he had to do. But for me, I recognized that. And then I saw him. His name was Ken Chanel. He was the CEO of American Express and he's black. So I think that was the first time that I recognized that I could aspire to be something so much bigger than the sport I played or so much bigger than what my dad had even accomplished, which was tremendous for where he got in his life. But I saw a different level. And for me, I wanted to attack it. Step one, create a vision and remember to be flexible and nimble. So I think first off, you have to find something that you're passionate about. I'm not one of these guys that is a subscriber to, hey, there's a really good idea, I'm just gonna throw money at it. For me, I need to understand it. So I think once you become immersed with it and if you're passionate about it, then you start understanding how it works. So you understand what the marketplace is, you understand who your audience is, you understand marketing, how you communicate to your audience, and then you also understand, right, is there a true demand? All these are things that you start to look at and say, these accumulate to what a good business strategy is. Step two, which is probably one of the most important, you create a network and you establish board members. I like people who are direct, people who don't dance around the true issue, who tell you what it is. Number two is your execution strategy. How, like, what is your history? How have you gone about creating businesses? And what are those businesses doing? Can you properly articulate to me what those businesses have been, where they were throughout the process, and how you, how you met your end goal? And number three, which I think is one of the most important, is your ability to want to expand, right? You have to have creative vision. These are all the things that I align with who I am personally, and I think those are the three things I look for in creating my own personal business board. So step three, form a relentless mindset where you cannot lose. My rookie year, we got a chance to go to Los Angeles and we were playing against the Lakers. Right? And I walk into the gym and I see Kobe Bryant shooting at the opposite end of the court. So I'm watching him work out for a minute, lace up my shoes, get my ball ready. I start getting my shots up, I start doing my thing. I get my 300 main shots up. I get done, I sit back on the sideline, I unlace my shoes and I think to myself, yes, yeah, so we're about to play against the Lakers. That's what I'm talking about, let's go, I am ready. And I look down to the other end of the court and I still see Kobe Bryant working out with the same speed, the same pace he was working out that he had an hour before I got into the gym. And I thought to myself, damn, that's, that's different. So I watched him for another 10, 15 minutes, I get ready to play in the game. It felt like Kobe had 40 on us that night, right? He probably only had 25. And I found him after the whole thing was over, after we lost the game, and I came up to him and I said, you know, Kobe, can you explain to me why you were working out the way you were? And he said, oh, because I saw you come in the gym and I wanted you to know that no matter how hard you work, you weren't gonna outwork me. So how do you take that same mindset and how do you translate that to who you are business-wise? That nobody is going to outwork you. Now, you might have to repackage your idea, you might have to rethink your strategy, but it's your job to keep working on it 
Because at the end of the day, nobody's ever going to give you anything. It's up to you to go out and take it. So step four, have integrity and have intent. Before George Floyd, I can network, I can find my way into a lot of different doors because of what I did, television-wise. But I really had to scrap and claw in order to create legitimate businesses with different Fortune 100 companies. But when George Floyd happened, I got a litany of calls from people that all of a sudden were asking me to sit on their board. And as I recognized that the landscape of the playing field had changed, I also recognized that it truly wasn't authentic. It didn't seem like there was real integrity there. But for me, I think that really changed the dynamic of how I wanted to do business. Because I recognized I only want to do business with people that have a real purpose to truly make change. I'm not talking about lipstick on the pig. I want to see you actually have strategies about how you are implementing change from a ground floor perspective. And I think if you can be fully transparent and frank with people about what your intent is and you find that connection integrity wise, then I think that's a business relationship that will excel. How, how to.